Okay, um, I would like to start with a quick poll. Who here with a raise of hands using uh, Maven in their day today? Okay, and uh, Gradle, who's using Gradle in the day today? Okay, nice, and SBT. <laughs> okay, so uh, enthusiastic uh, SBT uh, crowd, so uh, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Nathan Solnetsky, and I'm a back-end infra infrastructure developer at uh, Wix.com. And I was part of a task force at Wix backend that was in charge of, well, oh, seems like I have, uh, okay, weird. Um, okay, so uh, I was part of a task force that was uh, in charge of migrating all Wix backend code base from Maven to Bazel. Now, Bazel is Google's uh, build tool, which they use to build their giant monorepo with more than 2 billion lines of code which they open sourced a few years ago. And once we did this uh, migration at Wix, we saw that we had uh, a dramatic improvement in development velocity and much happier uh, developers. So here you can see, for example, we have uh, one of our larger uh, repositories. And with Maven, it took roughly 45 minutes to build the entire repo compile everything, run all the tests, and no, no matter what uh, really is the change that uh, was uh, done to the code. Now with Bazel, on average, it usually takes less than uh, one minute. A few uh, numbers on Wix backend. So we have around uh, 250 developers, more than 750 microservices. Now, uh, in terms of code base, we have more than 10 million lines of code, mostly in Scala, uh, but there is still some uh, in Java and also in Node.js. And we have thousands of builds running every day, and we hit production uh, as often as possible. So like I said, we, we migrated from Maven, and our uh, build server was TeamCity. And the way uh, our uh, code base is structured is we have many, many services and a lot of code, and also most of it depends on the same infrastructure code. So imagine thousands of uh, Maven modules uh, depending on the same code uh, for infrastructure stuff. And it's all snapshot dependency, meaning we wanted to get changes immediately uh, to all the dependents. So uh, on this uh, change to any infrastructure code, we have thousands and thousands of uh, build actions uh, queuing up on TeamCity for each of the Maven modules, and it took hours sometimes to get everything depleted. Now, with Bazel, we just uh, run it on the Google Cloud, and we have uh, all of our repositories there, and they all compile and run the tests simultaneously, and it, all, it usually takes just a few minutes to get the root level change propagated to all of the dependency graph. Okay, so, We'll, today, I'm going to show you the key features that make Bazel fast, correct, and scalable, and specifically how Bazel can help us improve the scale, Scala builds specifically and make them faster. So the key difference uh, with Bazel, uh, usually f uh, the paradigm shift with other um, build tools, is the explicitness and flexibility of the uh, configuration definitions. So you can uh, decide on which granularity you would like to have the basic build unit. You can decide to have like one Scala source file, and that will be the action of compilation that you will run. Or you can decide to have uh, the package level dependency, um, or you can have a set of packages that you run uh, in, the, in the same action that will be closer to the SBT project or Maven module. Now, this basic build unit is called a target in Bazel, and targets are instances of rules. So you may ask yourself, what is a rule? So a rule is basically a function that has the set of inputs and it provides 
a set of outputs that usually are files, right? And there are many different kinds of rules uh, that are defined for Bazel. We have Scala library, of course, but you can also have you also have rule for C++ binary or running a Python test or running shell script. Basically, Bazel is a generic dependency graph action executor. So it has many, many different kinds of rules for almost any language you can think of. But uh, we want to focus on Scala. So for example, you have here a very uh, simple uh, Scala library target uh, definition. So it's named A, and it as uh, the source files, you explicitly declare which source files uh, are for this uh, target, and at the, uh, in this case, it's a.scala. And it also depends on target C, which in turn will compile c.scala. And the output will be a.jar. And how do you invoke it? You just uh, type bazel build colon a if you're in the working directory of this package. Okay, so what other kinds of inputs can these uh, rules uh, have? So we saw that it could be source files, it can be dependencies, but there can also be all the tool configurations. So for instance, all the Scala compiler options are considered the uh, an input for this uh, rule or which JDK version you run. So basically any sort of input that has any uh, relevance and effect for the actions that are run by this rule have to be explicitly defined for Bazel. And why is that? Because of the sandbox property. So if you have some implicit dependency in your code on some file that you do not explicitly declare in your configuration, then your build will fail. So this sandbox property actually guarantees that no matter uh, what you uh, you have to define everything uh, inside of this sandbox, meaning that Bazel will isolate all of the files that you declare in the file system and not give you access to any, any other part of the file system and will also limit your network. So net network sandboxing means when you're running compilation or running any test, we will not be able to just go to the internet and download anything you want. No, that, that, that's done in a previous stage. So this uh, sandbox feature actually gives us deterministic reproducible builds because you always know exactly which out input you're going to get. There's no surprises. So you always have the same output no matter how many times you're going to run the same target build. Now, um, as I mentioned, the flexibility of the build unit, usually it will mean that you'll have many, many small targets. And that's a, a great advantage because when you run the compilation, it means that you'll have a small impact for the specific target. And also the part of the tree that depends on this target will be smaller because we're talking about smaller granularity. But of course, there is a, uh, it's a trade off. There are disadvantages. It will mean you'll need to manage many more build configurations and you need to maintain them and add dependencies between the different targets. So that is a disadvantage uh, for this uh, particular feature. But you can have uh, great tooling in place to help you with this management. Now, we have many more targets, and that probably means that not all of them depend on one another, and they can run independently and run more in parallel. So with Bazel, you, you, it tries by default to run as, much, as many actions as possible. At the same time, on your local machine, you will be limited to the amount of cores on your machine. And of course, with the, the alternative tools, you'll probably have a lesser degree of parallel work. Now, if you uh, have uh, tests in your code, uh, then you probably get parallel running of compilation and tests. So here you can see in uh, blue, we already have targets that have started to run their tests, but at the same time, 
dependent targets are now running compilation, and so you get even higher degree of parallelism. And the great uh, feature of uh, sandbox and deterministic uh, running of uh, your build means you have a great incremental um, function, right? Because you only need to uh, rebuild the small part of your graph that uh, you change some code in because everything else is put in, a ca in the cache with a hash key and you, c you, you know that you can guarantee that you don't need to rerun it because Bazel guarantees that. And think about your test code. If you don't change test code for really, really slow integration tests, there's no reason to run them. So you save a lot of time by using this uh, correct incremental feature of Bazel. And we're not really limited by the local machine that uh, we're running, no matter if it's on our laptop on this or the CI server, because Bazel has the cool feature of remote execution. So each action that is being executed is actually sent to a remote worker farm where you can have a crazy degree of parallelism. So we at Wix use the Google Cloud solution of remote execution. We have it as a service. And we see that we have hundreds upon hundreds of actions running at the same time and building our code base and running the tests. There are also open source uh, solutions uh, that you can set up on your um, cloud servers or on-premise and also enjoy the benefit of the remote execution. Now, if you so, it's great for the CI server. The, the the workers on this farm populate the cache, and the CI server can, of course, utilize the cache results uh, from one build to the next. And if you want to run this uh, actions from your local machine on your laptop, you can do that as well. Now, of course, there will be network latency here, so there is a feature. A uh, quite recent one in Bazel called dynamic execution. That means that you can decide whether uh, it will try to run both locally the action and remotely, and it will stop the slower action once the faster action already finished. So you get uh, the benefit of both having uh, local and remote execution, and just even uh, having a faster build uh, just managed automatically by this cool feature. So at Wix, we really saw the benefits here. Uh, I'll show you a few numbers so you can get a sense. If, you, if we run the one of our larger repositories, like I said, with Maven, and not using um, any caching mechanism whatsoever, it's 45 minutes. Now, if you use Bazel on your laptop um, and not using any cache, you always drop the time to 20 minutes. Why? Because it's a fast, they have higher degree of parallelism, we have smaller uh, targets, so you get faster time. And of course, if you run it on the remote uh, environment with the worker farm, it only drops down to 8.5 minutes, even though we didn't use any caching whatsoever in this example. Now, why do we still have uh, this uh, bigger number? because we're still limited by the amount of parallelism we can have because there's the critical path of running um, the dependencies, right? Uh, because you can't start running a dependent action before the last one finished. Although yesterday we saw a great talk by Stu Hood from Twitter about work being done um, at Twitter to have outlining, which will mean that you can get the header information from the action as soon as you can have it with a compiler and then already you can start the dependent action before the previous action compi compilation uh, finished completely. So that can really speed up uh, the performance. And there's also work uh, in the Scala Center about uh, pipelining and outlining, so it's really exciting times for Scala compilation. And of course, with the, the fully cached uh, option, once you have the second run, Bazel will analyze uh, the dependency graph, see that it doesn't really need to add an, uh, run anything, and only takes a few seconds to finish.
Okay, so I think that Bazel is definitely worth it, but it, it's not worth it in all cases, right? If you're a small startup just getting started and you have a small code base and you just want to have tools working out of the box, you don't need to think about it, then maybe Bazel uh, is not right for you because there is work that you need to do, of course, to maintain the build configurations, but also you probably want to do the adjustments to your code to adhere to the sandboxing principles, uh, like I mentioned about file access and network access, etc. So these are very good changes that you want to have for clean code and modular code, etc. But maybe for a small company that uh, want, want to run as fast as possible, it's not right for you. Now, as your code base grows and you have many more dependencies, the dependency graph looks bigger, more complex, and you may be starting to think, ah, you know what, these integration tests, this, uh, these automa automated tests, they take a long time to run. So maybe I won't run them after every, any code change, I'll just run them uh, each night or something like that. So then you start compromising between the quality of your code and how fast you can get to production. So once you reach that point, I really think that you should consider switching to Bazel because there shouldn't be a comp compromise. You want to have fast, correct builds and get to production uh, fast with a quality uh, build in action. So of course, if you have a very large code base, then I think Bazel really fits in really naturally and really is really optimizes and even shines in, in such examples of large code bases. It really, really makes a huge difference. Okay, so we saw a few of the uh, basic uh, cool uh, Bazel features, and uh, now I want to switch over to how uh, Bazel works with Scala. So with Bazel out of the box, it has support for C++ and Java. And for any other language, you have uh, these extensions or plugins for Bazel called rules. And in this case, we're talking about the uh, rule Scala, which is the open source project in the Bazel uh, GitHub organization. It's written in Scala and Starlark. So Starlark is the extension language for, for Bazel. It's a subset of Python, which is not Turing complete, so you don't get into infinite loops. And you, uh, you so you build uh, any, so you write anything that you want to have as an extension. We'll see a few examples uh, later on. So this uh, project is co-maintained by Stripe and by Stripe and, and Wix. And uh, it's adopted by uh, many companies. For example, they have Etsy, Meetup.com, Spotify. They all use uh, this uh, Rule Scala version. OK, so I just want to have a quick uh, refresher on the difference in the structure of the build configuration. Uh, between Bazel and other tools. So for SBT or uh, Maven or Gradle, you have a convention-based approach where they uh, have they know that they'll find uh, where they'll find the production code, where they'll find the test code. But with Bazel, uh, the build configuration is found adjacent to your code. So each package will have its own build configuration definitions where you have uh, the definition for compilation and tests, uh, etc. So which basic rules rule Scala supports? Uh, so the first one we already talked about is Scala library, which the action that needs to be executed is, of course, calling, invoking the Scala compiler. And the output will be a jar file. So here's the example I've already showed. You get uh, the a.jar and the sources and dependencies. And the second uh, basic rule is Scala binary. You want uh, to have, you want to run executables. So of course it will compile any source code and uh, dependencies that you require. And it will also output, other than the jar file, it will also output a shell script. And the shell script will just uh, 
run the main class on a JVM that it will spin up to ex run the executable Scala application. So here you can see an example um, where you define in the Scala binary definition the main class in this example com example foo. And, and then uh, when you invoke it with basil run colon b, it will uh, actually invoke the shell script and find the appropriate uh, main class. And the third basic one is, of course, Scala test. So here it's exactly the same mechanism as Scala binary, but with a shell script. But instead of executing the, your main class, it will execute the Scala test runner. And here you can see an example where you have uh, a set of uh, test files. So you define uh, the, the wildcard that uh, all the files that end with test.scala will be part of um, this uh, build target. And you see that when you run basil test colon example test, it will invoke the basil test runner. So quite simple there. So let's see a quick uh, example of uh, working in a repository. So I have a really, really simplistic uh, Scala repo here. Uh, just uh, simple additions and, uh, and numbers. So you see that uh, the wildcard can be used here. And we have the very simple Scala test here. And this is an example of how to dep depend on the complete label from uh, the relative to the workspace file. So the workspace file defines the entire uh, Bazel repo, and you get all the external dependencies that you need here, including uh, rule Scala itself, of course, that once you compile, it will first compile rule Scala, and then you'll be able to use it. Everything in Bazel is source dependency as much as possible. So now I'll just uh, run all the tests uh, in this repo, but just like, writing basil test slash slash dot dot dot. I hope uh, you can see. And it, uh, I've already run it before, so it got all the test results from the cache. So it's really, uh, it was really fast result. And of course, if I change uh, some of the one test and make it it will be a fail failure. And you see now that you understand that some file has changed and it will need to be rerun. So it took a second. So I'll just correct it again. And you see that it also always has the cached results and knows only to run the source file that has changed. OK, so that was a really quick demonstration. Now. What, uh, and of course, you have many more rules that Rule Scala provides. You have JUnit tests, Specs2 tests, Thrift libraries, Proto libraries, that of course are auto generated uh, code, uh, auto, auto code generators, and there are many more. And you can also add your own. So, like I said, you need to have some familiarity with Starlark, but you know, Python is really easy to get into, and you get a few constructs uh, that you have at Bazel, like the build context, etc., and you can get going and add anything that you find is missing from Rule Scala. Okay, so I'll show a few of the key features that uh, are inside Rule Scala that uh, will help you have um, correct fast builds. So the first thing to know is that there's a, an extensive end-to-end -end suite. It's battle tested. You have a lot of uh, regression uh, put inside there. And it also, interestingly, verifies the reproducibility principle. So it checks that it builds all of the um, build uh, uh, targets inside of the repo. And then it makes sure that on the subsequent run, with the time delay, so there was no randomness put in, and the hashes are exactly the same. So rule Scala then makes sure that it adheres to the reproducibility uh, function of Bazel. Now, in your repository, you may have modules from different kinds of uh, JVM languages. Uh, you have Java, Scala, Groovy, Kotlin. And you, we want to have everything built with uh, source dependencies. We don't want to manage binary versions between them, right? 
So with Bazel and the rules for each of these language, that's possible uh, because each of them adheres to a convention that they provide Java infrastructure. So you can have the Scala target depend on a Java target or something with Kotlin. Uh, there's no problem there. And everything will be built from source and cached. Now, what about uh, dependency management? So I talked about having more verbose build configuration, more small, smaller targets, meaning you have uh, more dependency that you, you need to add. So there are a few uh, nice features here. You have a flag for unused dependencies that it will, if you set it up, then it will scan each time you, you, build, you run the build and will provide for you warnings or errors on dependencies that you no longer need, and you can remove them with Buildozer, which is a tool that automatically manages the build configurations for you. And you just uh, ha keep your dependency graph smaller, and that means faster builds, right? And also an interesting uh, feature is strict dependencies. So this means that if uh, you have a full library and it depends on the specs two test uh, suite, and you also and it in turn specs two depends on scats. So, with if you have in your foo library source code import of cats, but you didn't specify it as a direct dependency in Bazel, then strict depths uh, tool will emit an error and say you need to de 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 uh, add a direct dependency here. And why is that important? Well. First, it's uh, basic uh, code hygiene and, and have a more correct and uh, right uh, build configurations. And also, it means that your code will be less fragile because if Specs2 decides to drop cats at some point, then your full library uh, won't break. And both the unused uh, dependency checker and the strict dependencies are based on JSON Zog's uh, class path shrinker plugin. Okay, we have a very nice uh, tool we developed at Wix that we use uh, with our, uh, it's we, together with the IntelliJ environment built in with an additional plugin. And this tool is called Depth Fixer. So what it does, it once you invoke it, it automat automat sorry, automatically builds the Bazel, um, runs the Bazel build and understands from the missing symbols which dependencies it needs to add to the Bazel build definition. Now, um, it knows which dependencies uh, it needs because it indexes all the jars during the build internally. And it also uses uh, an external indexing server for any code residing in other repositories or third-party dependencies. And this uh, tool is inspired by uh, Pants, which has a similar feature for automatically adding uh, dependencies. Pants is Twitter's uh, build tool. Okay, so a very important uh, performance issue uh, with uh, Bazel and Scala is uh, warming up Scala compiler and incrementality in the class level. So out of the box, Bazel will not, we will have actions that are independent of one another. That means that if you run an action, it will spin up a new JVM with a Scala compiler, cold Scala compiler, and it will run it. So that really is um, quite expensive. Now, if you have, if you set up the persistent workers like Rural Scala does, that means that this is a Bazel feature, persistent workers. It means that it will have like a pool of uh, Scala compiler, hot Scala compilers that it can use for the actions that are being run. So this is really important for your local development because you continuously want to, to, to check that your code still is still correct. Now, with, uh, there's, with rule, we have an alternative rule Scala called rule Scala Annex from the Hire Kindness uh, GitHub organization. And the difference here is that it uses Zinc. Uh, I'm sure that uh, almost all of you know that Zinc is the stateful incremental compiler used by Bloop and uh, with SBT. So 
rule Scala Annex, uh, all, instead of using the standard Scala compiler, uses Zinc. So that covers us both in the caching le of the level of the targets, the Bazel caches, and also sub-target level with the class classes inside of uh, your source file that Zinc can help you with uh, the caching there. Now, it's not being used currently in the official uh, standard rule Scala because the ba Bazel basically adheres to stateless compilers and have the cache uh, being uh, handled and managed by Bazel itself. And, it's, and you can also not work like this in remote execution because remote execution does not support currently having state. It's, everything is stateless there. It's just spin up new containers and run these actions. But it can def rule Scala Annex can definitely uh, improve your experience locally, especially if you have bigger targets. So you might want to consider that. And like I already said before, there is active work done at Twitter and Scala Center to improve the situation uh, even more with uh, stateful compilers and um, optimized compilers with outlining and pipeline, pipelining, like I mentioned. So this is a, a space that is actively worked on and uh, will have improvements in the future. So we'll see a very uh, simple demo of... Uh, of using uh, persistent workers. So here I have two identical copies of rule Scala um, repo itself. And I'm just uh, running uh, a build of part of the test suites for rule Scala. And you can see here that all of the, there are eight actions running because I have eight cores on my machine. So Bazel is trying to utilize as much as possible uh, in degree of parallelism, but um, this is uh, quite slow here. You can see it utilizes uh, the Darwin sandbox. So that means it, it's running in sandbox mode by default. Uh, there's no special flag here, so automatically it invokes the sandbox and means that you, you can rely on it and have uh, incremental uh, build which are faster. But in this case, when it k keeps on uh, building and running new JVM instances with the cold Scala compilers, then it's much slower. Okay, I think it's about to finish. Yeah, it's finished. Took 61 seconds. Now, uh, all I do here, the, the only difference is that I'm running it with strategy Scala C worker, which means that the persistent worker is going to be utilized. And you can see that uh, the actions are completing much, much faster here. And uh, yeah, it's going to finish much sooner. <laughs> yeah, only took 30 seconds. So it's a 50% improvement uh, in this case. And like I said, you can have even better results with Rule Scala Annex and with the exciting uh, compilation optimizations we have ahead. So that's, uh, that's it about Rule Scala. You can find out the link. Uh, you can go to the link here in the Bazel Build organization. It's an op open source, of course. Uh, we really recommend, uh, really like to get uh, some uh, contributions and for if you see anything is missing. And uh, if you want to uh, play around a little bit with the uh, Rule Scala uh, with a very simple uh, uh, exercises, you can check out this link. Um, I have a link at the end uh, for a slide share, so you don't need to um, copy it now. If you're interested in uh, learning more about the uh, migration stories to Bazel, so I have uh, I gave, I gave a talk at GEConf about different things you need to consider while migrating. Uh, around the granularity, about uh, how many repositories you want because Bazel works best with uh, monorepo, and dependency management, um, that's really quite different uh, in Bazel. And I also have an equivalent uh, blog series on, on this topic. And I also recommend the excellent uh, blog post by Lee Howitt, uh, Databricks on Speedy Scala Builds. So they took a little bit different approach 
but they have amazing results, so I really recommend checking that out as well. And we also open sourced uh, an automatic migration tool from Maven to Bazel that will let you that do does all the hard work for you and also gets you to finer grain targets. It only works currently in Maven from Maven to Bazel. Of course, we would be happy to work on uh, the SBT equivalent, and we love to get uh, contributions here as well. So to summarize, Bazel uh, is worth it in most cases, and it gives you faster builds, and the ecosystem is becoming better. Um, Wix is actively working on tools for IntelliJ to help with dependency management and really let you focus on your source code and having the tooling in place to help you with the, the build configuration. And we hope to open source uh, the IntelliJ plugins and the, the Depth Fixer tool very soon. And Rule Scala itself is mature and battle tested and, and used quite widely, like I uh, mentioned. So I really uh, recommend checking it out. So thank you very much. <laughs> so here's the link for SlideShare that I mentioned. and. You can check out uh, and follow me on Medium and Twitter to get more updates on Bazel and Wix. And yeah, questions. Hi, uh, hey. thanks for the talk. And sure. uh, I actually had two questions, but you just answered one, which was about the you know ID support, specifically IntelliJ IDEO. So it will come out soon, I guess. Yeah. You, okay. We have the official Bazel plugin, of course, um, but. We have all kinds of cool additions in, in our own additional plugin, so we really hope to open source it soon. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And uh, second question is, uh, so I'm using uh, Scala Hedgehog for testing. So in SBT, it's just easy to uh, put that uh, Hedgehog uh, into SBT settings. But uh, how, is, uh, how easy it is to uh, change the, or make it support uh, other test framework than the ones that you mentioned, like Scala test specs to Jamie. Right. So basically, um, you will probably need to create a, 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 to have the rule in place to have the the test runner flavor that that you're working with. So it, um, it's a matter of um, getting fami uh, familiar a little bit with the Starlark, the extension language for Bazel. And there are the building blocks in place to have test runners, um, that uh, alternative test runners that, that you would like. And then uh, you just have like the XML outputs for the tests, uh, for uh, the IDEs, etc. So I, I guess the basic work for just getting to work will not be that great, but uh, for supporting the IDEs environment, it it may be a bit more work. It's it, it's possible. I mean, we did it for specs too. It was missing before, and it didn't take too too much time, too much effort. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering more about the uh, ecosystem because usually build is not just compiling. So let's say f uh, um, cover code coverage. Uh, I don't know working with sonar queue scapegoat all those plugins that you have in addition in your build system is there support for it or is you have to add it by yourself every because basically there is loads of plugins available for sbt and maven the question to are right. there available also for right so yeah sbt and maven are both are with us for quite a long time so they have very rich uh, plugin environment uh, so of course uh, with basil uh, you have less of that I'm not sure about coverage. I'll check that, but uh, there will be if you if you if you see some plugin missing, you may need to to contribute it to Basil. But then everyone else can can enjoy it as well. 
Uh, how clever is a recompilation algorithm? I mean, uh, if we change some private methods, for example, will all dependencies uh, be recompiled or not? Uh, or it uh, just looks for uh, only public API changes? Yeah, so uh, there is a tool in Bazel called iJar that uh, really works really great with, uh, with Java. There are some limitations of, of it with Bazel. And the idea is that um, it only checks the public APIs. Then you have uh, faster because the public API hasn't changed. Uh, that means that uh, there won't be any recompilation. And um, it's the same with the outlining principles that are actively worked on, on uh, at the moment. Uh, that once you get the headers uh, and you see that there's any change, then you will need to recompile uh, or not, depending uh, on the result. Uh, so the, the, there is a solution for it. I know that iJar does not support uh, macros, uh, Scala macros at the moment. So if you use that, you probably uh, won't be able to gain this feature. Uh, thank you for the talk. I have a very down-to-earth question, and it's mainly around uh, releasing and versioning. So, I mean, uh, let's uh, more deploying in Maven Maven terms. Like, how do you get your jar to the artifact server? Can you use Bazel for that? And how how would you how do you do versioning, or how do you do these things at Wix.com? Okay, great question. So, uh, Bazel, you can do you can do. There are like generic rules that you can run. You can actually run anything you want in Bazel. Uh, but actually, we at Wix uh, decided to leave Bazel for the build build uh, phase, and then you have access to all of the uh, created uh, jars and and Uber jars. You know, you, you pack them up, and and then we have uh, a separate uh, service that uh, listens to the build events. We have the build event protocol for Bazel. And uh, we just uh, listen, and we know that a new deployable uh, was created, and we send it to our binary repository. And in terms of versions, uh, the, the service just uh, does um, an RC, just add, does uh, increment the RC version e every time it does that, that new de uh, deployable. And uh, yeah, so we do it uh, with semantic versioning. Um, how much work is maintaining all the build files? Because, for example, having a build file in each package uh, seems like a lot of work, especially while refactoring, for example. Yeah, so it depends. I mean, you can you can stay in the Maven or uh, uh, SBT level of projects or modules, and then you, it will basically be the same uh, like uh, with uh, these tools when you add the dependency in Maven or SVT. But uh, usually you, will prefer, you want to have uh, smaller targets. So that if you would work without any uh, additional tooling, so you, every time you do an import of something you don't have yet, you need to go to the build configuration and add it. Now, uh, that's exactly why Wix is developing these tools uh, for helping you with automatic uh, dependency management for you, so it's not part. It's not uh, a basic part of Bazel. You have the build dozer that you can run uh, commands, and you have scripts that add them. But you need to know what you uh, what to add. So the automatic uh, dependency management uh, is something that Bazel does not provide, and we hope to open source that soon. I hope that answers your question. Okay. One more question. So, uh, how does Bazel uh, handle the conflicts in dependency versions? So, is it handled by the automatic dependency management you just mentioned, or any other way? Right. So, um, first, you can have cyclic dependencies between uh, between uh, targets. So, Bazel will, will error on that. Now, for third-party dependencies, you mean about versions of third parties? So, there are uh, a whole bunch of tools. Uh, that resolve the Maven dependencies, basically. Uh, 
for your Bazel repository. And usually they uh, work like a one version policy. So that means you will need to change your API. There are um, variations that do allow you to have multiple sets of dependencies, but you, you should be really careful because the dependency is defined for the entire repository. That means you may end up with a target that's using dependencies from different trees and you know transitively you get a conflict. And but Bazel will not err on that, so you'll get random results in a class path. So you don't you, you, you're not even guaranteed which version will uh, will win in the class path. So the recommendation is just to work with one version for the repository. No more questions? Thanks, Nathan. Thank you very much. Thank you.